Mm, welcome to one of the, our Wednesday yachting luncheons. Wonderful to have everybody back here in the room. Sorry we're not in the grill room, but as you probably heard, the plumbing issue over there is going to keep us out of the grill room for a couple of months. And it's fun to be uh, meeting in this room anyway. We usually get a kind of a view of the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, look forward to an announcement about when the grill room will be happening again. So I also want to thank the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon attendees for an incredible luncheon last weekend, last Wednesday, you may have heard. Daniela Morose, six-time world champion, four-time Rolex Yachts Woman of the Year at age 22, uh, is the youngest and most decorated sailor the Bay Area has ever sent to the Olympics. And about three months ago, she came over and said she needed a little bit of help here and there to get the last bit of funding in. And we, yet, uh, last week, did an incredible job. The audience uh, put, it, put it up $70,000, which gives her the best sales and equipment and gear and training partners. And when you're as good as Daniela, uh, and you can fly across the water, up the breeze at 20-something knots, and down the breeze at 30-something knots, and wind foil, uh, foiling kites have gone as high as 50 miles an hour. So imagine being three feet above the water flying at those kind of speeds. And the crossing speeds are like 60 and 70 knots. And you got this kite above you and you're basically doing an acrobatic tightrope whopping adventure at you know high speed. Uh, well, there aren't that many training partners who can keep up with her. <laughs> so in order for her to get good training partners, they have to be flown in from wherever. And she left last Sunday four days ago, three days ago, to go off to, to basically be on the water 80 of the next 150 days. She will not be back until after the Olympics. So we had to give her a good uh, stash of bucks to go buy the best training partners and equipment and so on, and we did it. The Wednesday Yachting Lunch and did it, which was really a wonderful thing. So, um, which gets us to uh, what's going on with today. Kiteboarding is the newest form of this exciting thing that we call sailing. Um, but remember, sailing started sometime a long time ago with a reed over a raft, and we gradually evolved through latin rigs and all kinds of square rigger rigs, and the Italians give us the first triangular sails and Marconi rigs, hence the Italian name. And um, we, we, we in the San Francisco Bay Area pay special homage to sailing because as all of you know, in 1844, the popul there was no San Francisco, first of all, the small settlement all along Montgomery Street was called, who knows the name, Yerba Buena. And in uh, 1847, that Yerba Buena settlement changed its name to San Francisco, naming itself after the bay next to it. How many cities get named after the bay next to them? Well, San Francisco is one such city. And then in 1848, gold was discovered up the river, water again. And in December 1848, the population of this newly named San Francisco was 850 people. In 49, the population was 5,000 people. In December of 49, who wants to guess? 25,000 people. The population soared. Half of all the people in San Francisco arrived here after spending at least five months on a square rigger and coming around the tip of South America. So everybody here knew how to sail. And sailboat racing got to be quite a sport in the 1850s. In 1869, San Francisco Yacht Club, our parent club, was formed in a location that uh, yours truly and some, some uh, maritime archaeologists found south of the ballpark, and a location that was originally at the intersection of Long Bridge and Hobbs Wharf. They got booted out of the building after a year or so because the railroad had more clout and bounced in a couple of offices in San Francisco before landing in San Francisco, and then breaking in half in 27 to come here. All this time, people were racing sailboats, and in order to race them, they had to come up with, with some rules. The original couple of races, in fact, there are stories about two boats racing with a, with a $50,000 prize money. Holy moly, you're saying that's a big prize. And partially up the weather mark, they had to go out to around Mile Rock and come back, starting around Clay Street, uh, the Clay Street Pier, as it was called in those days. Anyway, part way up here, uh, one of the boats broke down, but another third boat, which wasn't officially in the race, was leading anyway. And by the time the race ended, nobody knew who won. So they said, no, 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 we're going to have the race again tomorrow. <laughs> Literally, they had the race again the next day. 
And then people said, we really have to come up with some rules. And so the first yacht clubs were based on racing rules. Years go by, years go by. We see the evolution of, you know, uh, schooners and uh, scows and all kinds of boats uh, to our modern day where we have carbon fiber foiling monohulls in the America's Cup. Well, that period of time when we were all racing wooden boats with cotton sails, when men were men, out here in this bay into 25, 30 knots breeze, is captured best by the incredible you know, Master Mariner organization. And I have to really tip my hat to my good friend and staff commodore, Terry Klaus and Lindsay for doing all this incredible work <laughs> over decades, 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 setting an example with Brigadoon. And, um, you know, basically all of us who've got the wooden boat fever, and I admit my addiction, uh, I've had um, six or something wooden boats starting back in 1961 when I had a 210 called Southwester, a uh, plywood boat. Anyway, uh, we all realize there's something to this this classic wooden spirit that we have on San Francisco Bay. The Master Mariner does a brilliant job of it. And so uh, our speaker today, before he came here, had some flavor for that because in 1959 his dad bought a two-car garage where they had a little kind of boat business going on called Car Craft. And that became the beginning of Sea Ray. His dad started cranking out boats and um, you know, went from this little two-car garage, hired all of his buddies to be in the business. Some of them got, went on to get all kinds of uh, prominent jobs inside the industry, and they kept growing and growing and growing. And my buddy in 1979, Chris Ray, decides, you know, this is, I'm spending all my time on my boat here in Detroit. What's, what is there to the rest of the world? So he gets his Corvette, comes to San Francisco, and loves his place immediately, says this is the most amazing thing in the world. But his dad's cranking out boats, so the business is getting bigger. No more two-car garage, now they've got six plants. And so in 1987, the dad, his dad, um, sells the business to Brunswick. And um, poof, that is that for that business. It's, it's a great business. People that I have who are buddies who have sea rays love their boats and our speaker today comes from an incredibly genuine maritime heritage. So Chris has now, this is I think his seventh, sixth or seventh Wednesday Yachting Luncheon and so um, uh, he is probably the most frequent speaker in the uh, 33 years since I first started doing this in 91 that we've ever had. I've had a little over a thousand speakers and Chris is six or seven of those thousand speakers. And during this last year since he uh, kind of retired from his high tech career, he's been taking zooms of pictures. If you walk around the yacht club, you can't find a, you know any room hardly that doesn't have at least one or two or more Chris Ray photographs, so we're blessed by that. But he started putting them in books a while ago, so now I think he's up to like 18 or so books three of which you can buy in the catch-all store right next door. And his idea for this book is wonderful because where else could we see collected in one place all these great, wooden, beautiful sailboats? And so with lots of respect and a big smile, please welcome our friend, Chris Ray. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Ron. Appreciate that. Thank you all for coming. It was, uh, I guess you had to decide whether to watch, uh, come in, watch the Stad Amsterdam or go to the Cruising Club of America today. The Stad Amsterdam pulled a fast one on you and came through at six o'clock this morning, so maybe they didn't get, want to get rain down. I don't, I don't know. But at any rate, so let's, uh, let's get into this without further ado. This Ron's right, there are, there are 18 books, and as it turns out, you know, uh, for me, um, mm -hmm. racing sailboats is one of the most wonderful things to shoot. It's a, you know, there's a, it's a glorious vista out here, and watching people in action is just one of the greatest things I could ever find. But having said that, I wrestled with this talk a bit more than most, um, because there's, it, it's not often that a guy who likes a blowhard like me who likes to hear himself talk, it's not often I find myself in a room with a lot of people who know a lot more about my subject than I do. 
So, so I come to this with great humility. I am going to uh, race you through a bunch of uh, racing photographs that I took over the last 20 years of the Jessica Cup and the Master Mariners Regatta. And bear in mind, please, that I was taking pictures of gorgeous, beautiful boats, not paying any attention to who they were or what they were up to or any of the rest of that. So as I start to do the research so I can do a talk like this, I start to realize, like Alice going down the rabbit hole, there's this whole universe down here that I literally know nothing about. It, it, these boats, they're, all of them have these rich histories, some of which are very tragic. And so uh, let me take you through that. Bear with me. We'll, uh, we'll do this together. Now this is the cover of the thing, and we'll have them over here for later, if should anybody care. Um, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about me a little bit and how this all happened. I'll tell you a little bit about the pictures and uh, give you some statistics about this, what it was, what it was involved, and then uh, where you can get this, where, how you can interact with these in a in a more detailed way, if you should you be so inclined. So, who am I? I joined the St. Francis in 1999 as a singer. My, uh, my father-in-law cooked up this scheme to get me into the Bohemian Club. I don't read music, and so I had basically no chance of, of getting in with that uh, audition. They liked me, but uh, they said, you know, our conductor is also conducting the Sons of the Sea at the St. Francis Yacht Club. Why don't you go over there and try out? Well, I fell deeply in love with everything about the St. Francis Yacht Club, and you can't peel me out of here. I don't think I'm the top... Uh, a user of the upstairs bar, but I'm, I'm got to be in the top ten. Um, Jesus. So, in in twenty in twenty twenty hundred in two thousand, a longtime member of the yacht club, seeking to offload some of the responsibility for taking pictures of social events, Tom Mulan, runs a thing called Photo Lab two thousand, wherein he will trade his expertise about taking photographs to a bunch of youngsters like us. To, I was a youngster still back then. Um, the notion being that we'd come and fill in for him. Well, I, I'm not that guy, but I did fall deeply in love with taking pictures of sailboat racing. And digital photography came about about the same time. So I have the great opportunity to get out on the water, pull a card out of my camera, stick it in a laptop, and run a slideshow the same day that, that when everybody's coming in off the water and telling their lies about what happened at the Windward Mark. Great fun for me. Now, that, that, that's the good news. The bad news was the technology back then was so I could get a slideshow put together, but I couldn't do any editing of it. I mean, I could delete the picture of my, of my shoe that I got, or if something was horribly out of focus, I could delete that. But no more editing could be done because the technology was so slow it couldn't manipulate the images fast enough. So I was just putting everything up um, in its rawest form. So uh, having said that, you know, I'm around here from, Mar from March until the end of November taking pictures of racing sailboats and putting up slideshows for the, the, uh, the combatants. Um, that's uh, 18 books and magazines later. And I think Ron's right. There's something like seven or eight... Uh, T and WYLs, Tuesday Yachtsman's Lessons we used to have. Uh, there were a couple of, uh, two or three Carnage shows, which uh, I would actually threaten people to get them to come. I told them that I'd talk about them if they didn't, if they weren't here. So that, that, that got a bunch of people to come. Uh, and so from there, there are something like 20,000 photographs in my archives of the 20 years of Master Mariners and Jessica Cup uh, photos that I that I took. So that's uh, three terabytes of, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a three with 11 zeros behind it, <laughs> bytes of stuff. This book is 118 pages, there's 750 pictures or so in there, which meant I had to choose one out of 30, which wasn't, in, in some cases it was easy, but in a lot of cases it was very, very difficult to actually come to the ones that I was going to include in the show. Now, I've, I've taken great liberties with these, and we're going to blaze through them because I couldn't, you know, this is the other problem. Which of your children is your favorite? Uh, all of them? Uh, well, I can't show you all of them, so I had to pare them down. 
The ones you're going to see in this slideshow work the best on in this kind of a venue. Uh, for the most part, the, the pages in the book had to be laid out in a way that the page in a book would work. And so there are some photos in this that weren't included because they wouldn't fit into the format, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Bear with me. Okay, so let's let's kick it off. Now I did this I did this alphabetically. Also, oh, I got it. Also, I got it. Credit where credit is due. In my research to tell you a little bit about these boats, I I am borrowing um, generously from Latitude 38 from Kimball Livingston. Bill Belmont was kind enough to to uh, help me with some of these things. Terry Klaus has helped me a lot with uh, who these guys are and what they were up to. And uh, if I've looked, there's also uh, the race results from our website as well as uh, a number of bloggers on the web who will remain nameless for reasons you will, uh, will quickly realize. So this is Ace. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense of what's going on here, this is a 43-foot R-class sloop, which was designed by Charles Moore and built by the Madden and Lewis uh, Yard in Sausalito, launched in 1926. This boat was built for Artie Russo, whose grandnephew is sitting right over here and is a proud owner of Alpha now. Uh, Artie Russo was often referred to as Ace, and so here's his boat, Ace, um, and seen here in the Jessica Cup in 2015. Ace was bought by our own Bob Caldernell, who lives up in Seattle and is basically uh, in line for sainthood for the wooden boats he's saved and reconditioned. Uh, this is a, quite a fast boat and a real beauty on the water. This is Aida. Uh, this is a Thomas Colfin gaff schooner built in 1962. We're seeing her here with red sails in 2005. And again, with white sails in 2009, I'm reminded that um, Ron says you'll pay more attention to me if I, if I blast the thing with I got the, the obligatory pirate flag. It's always good. Here is a, the first of my sad stories. Here's another red sailed uh, schooner that it took me a while to find. Bill Belmont helped me with this one. This is Aldebaran. It was built by... Hayden Brown, starting in 1971. This is the only time I saw her was a Jessica Cup in 2011. Sadly, she went on the rocks off of Point Richmond uh, on uh, the 4th of July in 2013. It was a total loss. Really sad. This is not a sad story. This is the hay, the hay barge Alma, which we see out all the time. I'm using this as a way to show you what a double page spread might look like in the book. Um, we've got her Alma here from uh, 2012 and 2016. She was named a national uh, historic monument, uh, landmark and as of uh, uh, 1988. I mentioned Alpha earlier. Here's one of our favorite. This is a, uh, a spark, a, uh, a Sparksman Stevens aluminum hull from 67, now owned by Nick Raggio here. Uh, this is her in the Jessica Cup in 2005 uh, with her longtime owner, of Rick Pfaff. Uh, that's Heather Flick, no, no relation to Melissa Flick, I understand. Um, Mario Schumann, uh, uh, Mike Radiani, and Tommy Gilmore. Um, Alpha rates two pages in, uh, in my book, and she's, a, she's really gorgeous. I hope you agree. She was built for Ted Stevens, who owned her for many years before Rick bought her. Apparently, she's never been any, under any other bridgie than the St. Francis. This is another sad story. This is Abster. I only saw her once. Uh, this is a 32-foot Bristol Channel Cutter with a very star-crossed boat. She was uh, almost complete when she got caught in a yard fire in uh, 1986. She was finally launched in October of 2000. And this picture of her is in 2004. This is one of my first brigadas I was shooting. Uh, Jeff Weaver was helicoptered off her in uh, off of Monterey at Christmas Day 2014 in 20 foot seas. Uh, and we think she was lost. I, I haven't been able to see anything more about Abster. I have four different one design classes in the old wooden uh, boat book. These guys are here because they're alphabetically first. Uh, these, these are bears. The first of one, which Mary was built at the Nunes Boatyard in Sausalito in 1931. I have here uh, 
Mary, Pola, Panda, Sugarfoot, Huck, and Little Dipper, Renegade, Chance, Camembert, Puff, Magic, and Kodiak. Now, there are four pages in this is just give you a sense of what, uh, what's in here. I got, you know, we got the drone shot and all sorts of stuff. And this is uh, a, uh, a mix of photos from 2005 through 2021. So not to be uh, not, not to not to be second. The, here are bird boats simply in second place because of the alphabetically. Uh, birds are t are uh, 30 foot designed by John Alden. You guys all probably know all this, but uh, this is the oldest one design class on the West Coast, according to my blog senses. Uh, they've been racing on San Francisco Bay since 1922. Apparently, of the 23 built, 22 were still. Um, is still in, uh, still afloat or still sailing. First boat was built by Madden and Lewis uh, in Sausalito and splashed in 1921 for Leon Defemery, who was the 10th Commodore of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Um, that boat was named Osprey, and uh, once again, looking to the bloggers there, <laughs> she had sort of a, she, she went ashore uh, north of here. And the question was whether she's stolen or whether she floated off on her own. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I'll leave that to the bloggers on the web to, to, uh, to, to, to and, and you all to decide which one of those stories is actually true. In this case, we're looking at um, Oriole, Widgeon, Polly, it's going the wrong way, and uh, Kookaburro from the start of a 2014 Master Mariners. And here we have one of my oldest pictures. Um, this one in, taken in 2004 is uh, from left to right, uh, Petrel, Oriole, Skylark, and um, Curlew. And that was taken in 2004. This is Bounty. It's a 52-foot Sparkman and Stevens beauty. Uh, Y'all dropped in, or dropped, um, launched in, in uh, 1950. Um, Dan and Sue Spaulding own her now. Uh, she's quite a beautiful boat. And this, uh, the, the one in front of Coit Tower, this picture here, um, I took, um, let's see. Oh, look at that. I dropped it off. Nice. Okay. I got to this, uh, you know, Ron and I had a, a frantic phone call on Monday about, uh, you know, is anybody coming to this thing, et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, and make sure that you bring a flash drive and a pointer and, 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 and so I got to the talk without my notes. <laughs> How I got out of the house without the notes, I don't know, but uh, just for future reference, the front desk was able to recreate my notes for me, so I'm working from those. This is Briar Rose. Um, this is a 32-foot John Hanna, John Hanna designed Tahiti catch. She was floated in 1939. Apparently, Briar Rose is code for Sleeping Beauty. Uh, you know, what are you going to hear on the blogs? You know, I mean, is that really true? I don't know. Um, seen here in 2012 and 2022, um, I love the fact that they've changed the hull color. Uh, and we were flying the Don't Give Up the Ship flag, the uh, famous last words of James Lawrence during the Battle of uh, the, um, the War of 1812 on Lake Erie. This boat I think you all know. The guy who owns this boat sitting right here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna splash him with the laser. But the reason I use this photo for this presentation is this is the only racing shot I have of Brigadoon with her, uh, with her fisherman displayed this beautifully. Now there is in this yacht club a really gorgeous staged shot with the Golden Gate Bridge behind, taken by a very famous photographer. Who, Terry's going to tell me who. Mendelwitz. Easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah, a very famous photographer who was really good at this sort of thing, and it showed. Um, you know, getting a shot like this with a gate behind is really something. I'm deeply envious of that shot. Now, remember, that's all staged, and so this is a racing shot. So this, as far as I'm concerned, this is the real thing. This is a 65-foot Harishoff design gaff-rigged schooner built by the Britt brothers in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1924. 
And uh, this is a, I've got millions of pictures of her. She rates two pages in the book. And, um, you know, in all points of sale, apparently she was owned by Sterling Hayden for a while, but Terry and his family have owned this book for almost 50 years now. And they get her out religiously, which God bless you. That's awesome. <laughs> this is Bright Star. It's a 53-foot uh, Edson Shock cutter built in Long Beach in 1935. Uh, I've got a couple of shots over here from uh, October of, of, of 2015, and this is uh, uh, 2012. Um, this boat is owned by Ted Hall. Apparently, according to Kimball Livingston, uh, they found this boat half submerged in the Sacramento River in the 80s. And Ted Hall, God bless him, has kept this boat in glorious condition since, since finding her and restoring her. This is Chorus, looking good. It's a 38-foot Ketterberg designed mahogany sloop. Um, the shot with the spinnaker is from 2004, and this other one is from 2012. This is uh, Peter English keeping her in wonderful shape. I'm quoting Kimball Livingston uh, liberally here. This is Derade, perhaps the most famous yacht in the world. This is Peter Kimball's word. This 52-foot yawl, her 1931 Transpac sweep was the first boat to ever do it. This win launched the design career of Olin Stevens. Matt Brooks shocked the world by winning the 2013 Transpac in her. Now, sadly, we've lost uh, Pam Levy recently, and I have prettier pictures of Duraid, but I include this one because she's managing the mizzen here. And that's the best picture of her I have aboard Duraid. This boat is Encore. She's a 39-foot Concordia yawl, uh, launched in 1966. This picture's from, from 2022. This is a boat you, well, this is the Elizabeth Muir. It's a 48-footer, a McInnes schooner, built by Babe Lambert in, in the the Bellinas Lagoon. I, I have trouble picturing that, but apparently that's what happened. She was launched in 1991. Great sale number for something that was born in 1991. These are two pictures of her, one from 2012, and this one's from uh, 2018, shot uh, by a drone off the race deck here. My drone. This is Fairwind. This is uh, another Sparkman and Stevens y'all, built in 1957. This is from 2021, um, and uh, she's looking really good here also. Now, the Latitude 38 article I found about her said that they, they were going to start, they were going to take her down to the Sea of Cortez and keep her in Los Angeles. Luckily for us, that's not happened to be the case yet. She still lives up here, according to Terry. So that's, that's good news. Right, right, which is great. And now we're into Farallon Clippers. I think we have Bill Belmont in the room. I met him earlier, so he must be here. I hope he's here still. Um, these are 38-footers, uh, which were which, which had quite a great story about this on the web. I hope it's true. Uh, these were launched beginning in 1938. Six of them were bought at the same time and built by the Stevens Yard in Stockton. There was some controversy about that. Um, but uh, but uh, these were built for $4,750 a piece, which I, I love that. <laughs> now, this is Echo from, 19, from 2005. Echo was lost between Fiji and New Caledonia in 2013, in January. Uh, he, she was being single-handed by Jack Holder, and... Uh, he hit something and he couldn't keep her afloat. They had to take her off, uh, take him off, uh, which is a sad. Credit is uh, this one here. That's Bill's boat. Um, from uh, that, that shot's taken from a drone in 2021. Uh, this is Hannah. Um, I shot her in 2016. This is Mistress. Um, I guess Mistress and um, Boisant are both owned by Jennifer Hinkle now. Um, this one is, this shot's from 2015, this one is from 2004, um, and then VIP here is, 
more recent shot from 2022. Um, Mistress, just another, but this boat was owned by our Commodore Aldo Alicio, who was our Commodore in 1970. Aldo was uh, famous for torturing his crewmen with uh, fried egg and mayonnaise sandwiches <laughs> on the trip back up here after doing the off the, sh off the uh, coast races. Uh, they'd go and drink themselves silly, and then the next morning, here's, here's breakfast. <laughs> Fried eggs and mayonnaise, nice. <laughs> There's a price to be paid. This is, this is Frida. Uh, she was launched in 1885. It's a 50-foot sloop. The, once again, the bloggers are saying she's the oldest operational sailing yacht on the West Coast and perhaps the whole country. Now, I may get some argument from, uh, from, from the people in this room on that. But I thought that was a great story. I have her here in 2018 and again in 2021. This is Frida B. That's a steel-hulled 80-footer gaff-rigged top sail schooner designed by Charles Wilholtz, uh, Witholtz and launched in 1991. This shot's from 2016. Beautiful. Beautiful. This is Gold Star. I have a bunch of pictures of Gold Star. This is a 47-foot schooner launched in 1960. Got lots of pictures of her. This one I picked for our purposes here because with the SS Iowa here being dragged down to her museum berth in Los Angeles on this day in 2012. This is the Hawaiian chieftain. We haven't been seeing much of her lately for a pretty good reason. She got bought by the Grays Harbor Historical Seaport up in Washington State. Uh, this is her in 2004. Uh, she's a 103-foot square rig topsail catch built in Lahaina, Hawaii, in 1988. Now, she's been laid up as of 2020 for what is called a wastage of steel plate, which is a horrible-sounding uh, uh, name for rust. Um, but <laughs> hopefully, they, apparently she's on the hard, um, and hopefully someone will save her, but it's not clear that that's going to happen. I had a Swedish partner in the early 90s. This is K of Jotaboria. Now, everyone else would pronounce Gothenburg, Gothenburg, but my Swedish partner, and remember the Swedes call Sweden Sveria, so well, you know, what are you going to do? This is K of Jotaboria. She's a 52-foot Sparkman Stevens Yall, built in Denmark in 77. I have her here in 21, shot from my drone, and here she is again in 20. Uh, in, in 22. This is the last of my one design bunch. These are Lapworth 36s. This is Lita 2. We have Papoose here and we have Echo here. Uh, pardon me, Olay here. Um, these were launched in mid-1953. Turns out Ron Young right here has bought Olay, so I guess we were going to start seeing her in the Master Mariners from now on, which is always good. Maybe the Jessica Cup, too, and heaven knows who probably show up for some more races. You can't keep him down. <laughs> he did. He did. Now, not, sh not, not shown in, in that last picture are Eventide and Sayonara, but both of those feature in the book. There are three pages of Lapworths in my, uh, in my book. This is Legacy. I only saw her once. Uh, this is a Hinkley Bermuda 40 Yall. Now, before you guys get upset with me, this is a William Tripp design and a really beautiful looking craft. First, uh, these were, the first of these were launched in 1960. The 203 of these built up until 1991, according to Wikipedia. Uh, they had three different styles of, of these. Uh, like I say, I just saw this one the once in 2017, but... Uh, you know, she, she cut a, uh, she's a beautiful, beautiful boat. This is Lydia. Pardon me. This is Legend. I made a mistake on Lydia, on, on Legend before, but I won't get into that. This is a 52-foot Sparkman Stevens Yall that was splashed in 1954. A real beauty. I took this picture of her in 2015. This is Lydia. It's a 44-foot shocked cutter that was 
that was launched in 1956. Um, these shots are 2004 and 2015. Our own Bob Hanault owned her for those years. I understand that she's now owned by Laura and James Emmett Clark Moore, which is great news. Hopefully they'll keep bringing her out. This is Monty Kai. Did uh, Ken manage to make it today? No, I, I was uh, emailing back and forth with Ken in a way, and I was hoping he'd be able to show. He said some, something about a car not working. Um, a guy with a wooden boat, you think it wouldn't let a car problem stop him. <laughs> right? But this is a 40 foot uh, Angelman gaff rigged catch, which was built in Taiwan in 1970. Uh, here she is in 2005. This is my favorite picture of her, and this is uh, his favorite picture of her from 2011. He liked that head-on shot. And th this boat gets two pages in my book on all points of sale. She's a real beauty. Well, all of these are real beauties. Speaking of uh, which, this is Macora. She's a 47-foot a cutter. Um, she was built in the UK in 1933. It's a... Interesting blogger story about her. Apparently, the uh, original design they were going to make in northern England, and the, uh, the guys who were building her didn't think that, that she was going to be stout enough. And so not only did they shore her up quite a bit inside, but somebody uh, latched onto a pile of teak. So this boat is made out of teak, um, which is really something. Uh, we have her with red sails here in... Uh, in uh, 2022 and white sales in 2021. That, that's a drone shot there. This is a boat that may be familiar to some or most of you. This is Martha. She's a 68 footer built in the stone boat yard here in San Francisco in 1907. Uh, James Cagney owned this boat uh, 90 years ago. I, I, can somebody do that for me? I, you guys, I'll get you guys. <laughs> that, that's the best I can do on short notice. Um, this boat was dropped in the yard um, in, uh, to, in, in 1917, uh, 1976, excuse me, and her whole port side was stove in. Uh, she was declared a total loss, and, and Del Egbert, God bless him, saved her from the scrapyard. And uh, it's a good thing she did because this is a really beautiful boat to catch out on the bay whenever she's out in, in all her glory. This is the Matthew Turner. This is one of the Call of the, Call of the Sea boats. Um, this is a 132-foot brigantine. Uh, she was designed after the ship Galilee, which was launched in the early 1800s and was built by and designed by Matthew Turner. Who knew? What a... Great name to, to, to call the boat after the guy. Now, this is last year's Commodore's boat, and can anybody ask me, any, anybody here have any idea why I'd have this in, the, uh, in a slideshow? Well, come on. Although Bo, I think, went to the, uh, he went to the other lunch today, so maybe I should have left him out. What do you think? <laughs> I did break, I, I broke my rule here. This is a big boat uh, series shot. And it was the best shot I've got of, of the Mayan spinnaker watch, which I think is uh, glorious. And let this be a lesson to all of you. Uh, from a, st a photographer's standpoint, if you've got a, a, uh, a green and yellow fisherman or a spinnaker that looks like this, and you're clever enough to get all your crew wearing the same color follies, you're going to get your picture taken. Like, like I tell you. <laughs> Sorry, that's just the way it is. This... Uh, this is a John Alden schooner, which was launched in 1947. It was owned by uh, David Crosby from Crosby, Sills, and Nash for many years before Bo, Bo bought her. I've got her here in, uh, in uh, this is uh, September of 2022, and this is uh, from my drone in 2021, and uh, this is uh, from uh, May in uh, 2016. This boat is a mystery. I got the name off the transom. The boat's name is Mystery. She was out for our Jessica Cup in 2005, but she was not signed up. I'm doing something that looks like that ought to be in our Jessica Cup, for heaven's sakes. I got two pages of her, but I know nothing about this boat. Love to, love to hear more. I just saw her that one weekend in 2005. 
Um, g glorious looking thing, isn't she? This is Pegasus. You guys may know this story. She's a 51-foot Alden design catch uh, mm -hmm. built of Philippine mahogany. Uh, she was splashed in 1972. Um, this is now sailing as the Pegasus Project. They take uh, the disadvantaged kids out for sales, which is a fine, fine enterprise. Uh, this is 2012, 2016, and 2022. Out and looking good. This is Polaris. This boat was... The, the blogs are not clear on this. She was launched between 1906 and 1910. Um, these pictures are 2005, 2012, and 2022, or, pardon me, 2016. Uh, and we're complete with our plug for the Spalding Center here. That's got to get that in for Polaris. This is Pursuit. Pursuit was owned by... Uh, Ron McMahon uh, for more than 50 years, and his passing led, uh, I guess she was in the yard. Uh, Vince Castellana tells me he has seen her aboard a ship. She's headed back to Germany, I think, where she was built uh, to be refit, which is, a wonder which is wonderful news. She was launched in 1929 as Avatar in Germany, and these pictures are, this is, this is 2012, this one, and this one is 2015. Now, I couldn't resist putting this in because the Hangar One Vodka blimp is in this one, along with a field full of pink geraniums on, on Alcatraz, which just made this a really pretty picture and, and uh, suitable for, for being in, the, in this thing. This is random. Now, we've got her in white tops here and green tops here, which is uh, good. Somebody's keeping track of her. This is a... Uh, I, when I first looked at this, I'm going, what's up with this? Those are storm warnings, right? I'm going, what is going, what's, what's going on with that? Well, this is random. She's a 30-foot hurricane class built by the Nunes brothers in Sausalito. She was splashed in 1949. My shots of her 2012 and 2015. Turns out the Clausen family's owned this boat for 70 years. And she's been a sometimes uh, flagship of the Richmond Yacht Club. I, I didn't know any of that. So uh, good, for, good for them. I, but just as a, an aside, um, hurricane warnings on your sail, really? I mean, does that mean you need that much breeze to go fast or what? I mean, geez, that, that doesn't seem, well, you know, I'm superstitious, maybe too much so. This is Royono. I had trouble identifying who this was. Um, this is, uh, she's 71 feet. She was built, she was designed by Alden, built by Harishoff. Uh, in 1936, she was splashed in uh, Bristol, Rhode Island. This is, this shot's from uh, 2016. It's the only time I've seen her out for the Master Mariners, which is a shame. She lives right outside the doors here, which is, makes it doubly embarrassing because I couldn't figure out who she was. I mean, every time I go out to the races, I pass her. And there's two guys working on that boat pretty much every day, and I'll bet you if we went out there, they're probably working on it a day, which is uh, great if somebody can keep her up like that. She probably needs it. It's all woodwork here and brass and plenty to do, as anybody who owns a wood boat knows. <laughs> this is Ruby, which is an interesting story. She's a 60-footer who was designed by Josh Pryor, the captain. The hull was uh, constructed by Millerick Brothers in 1981, and the rest of the outfitting was done by Josh Pryor. Uh, the boat's on the hard at the moment. I don't know why. Uh, the website says, uh, you know, come back and get news, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that isn't bad news. This from 2014 and this one from 2016. This boat I only saw once. Um, this is Master Mariner's 2004. This is a boat named Runa. Thanks again, Bill, for helping me figure out who this was. She was built in Denmark in 1918. And you look in the blogs looking for Runa 4, you get all kinds of stories, which is kind of fun, actually. Uh, one of them had, had, had her built as a yawl to begin with. Now, you got five people in the cockpit right now. So anybody, anybody got an idea where you're going to put a a mast for y'all? Where's the mizzen going to go with these guys? I mean, geez, that's going to be even a really tight fit. Uh, a. B, the boat's been seen in Pismo Beach, supposedly. 
I saw another blog that had her being completely refit in 2010 in Brest, France. My only explanation is maybe there's more than one Runa 4. I, you know, other than that, I can't figure out how a boat can be being put together in Brest, France, and be in Pismo Beach at the same time. That's, that's, that's uh, being two places at once, you can't do that. This is Santana. You guys probably all know this boat, but it's a Sparkman Stevens 55-footer built in Wilmington uh, for our member William L. Stewart in 1935. Seen here in 2005 and again in 2012. You know, here's, a, here's an example of a beautiful old wooden boat. It was owned by a guy who owns a yard, for heaven's sakes, which I guess is, you know, would have some advantages. This is Sequest, she's a 36-foot uh, Angelman gaff rig catch built in 1961 by American Marine in Hong Kong. We're seeing her here in, 19, in uh, 2022. Be beautiful boat. <coughs> this is another call of the sea uh, boat. This is the 82-foot steel-hulled schooner uh, Seaward. Uh, she was splashed in 1988, and this is, shot is taken in 2016. I include this A because she's very pretty, but B because I never pay any attention to anything other than framing the boat. So look at the bridge. Jeez, now maybe they've all pulled over to look at Seaward, but I think it's probably, remember this is Memorial Day regatta, so everybody's trying to get someplace, I guess. This is Sequester, which is owned by um, Hans List, who I guess is the current Commodore of the Master Mariners Association. Do we get Hans today or no? Not, no, no, not, no such luck? Jeez, why did I include him in the show then? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> this is a 36-foot Hannah Gaft rig catch from 1940, a shot here in 2012 and again in 2022. So she's, uh, she's a regular, and I'm glad to see that she's out. I might ask for some help here. This, is, uh, this boat's name is Shearwater. Now, Shearwater is the name of a bird, so when you're trying to do any research on the web and you're using a boat, a, a, a name that's that common, uh, you get a bunch of junk and it's really hard to, to go through. We have a member of this club who owns a boat named Shearwater, which is a 36-foot C&C, but I don't know that the, Jean Lacey is the name of the member, but I don't know if that's, no, that's her not. boat. Um, my suspicion is it's not, but having said that, Two boats named Shearwater. Uh, okay, could could be. So I don't know who this who this is. These two shots are from 2016 and 2021. This is a, obviously a drone shot. This is a boat I only saw once. Also, this is Simpatico, uh, looking very good in the, in our all blue follies. That's that's great work. Uh, this shot's from 2005 also, and I wasn't able to find anything else about her either. She was in our, uh, in our results from the Jessica Cup, but no other information about her. This boat's in here just for old time's sake. This is serious. No, I'm, I'm serious. This is serious. <laughs> this is R.C. Keefe at the helm of, the, of a CNC 37, apparently with uh, Tommy Gilmore and Ernie Rodriguez, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> According to both of these guys, and I, I interviewed them separately about this particular day, this is 2004 for the, for the uh, Master Mariners, RC splashed the boat for this regatta. Now, you guys are all familiar with what happens to wood boats when they sit on the hard, so apparently she starts leaking the minute she put her in the water. Ernie said every time we changed tack, you could see the sky through the, <laughs> the top sides. <laughs> and so by the time they get to Treasure Island in the finish, he said the water's up to their, you know, well above their knees down below. So they, they uh, spent a fair amount of time getting the water out of her, at which point R.C. says, let's get the sails down and stop stretching her out, which is what he said. Of course, they couldn't get the engine started once they got the sails down. So. <laughs> it's a boat. Come on. <laughs> this is a really pretty boat. Um, Sunda, it's a 35-foot uh, Ben Seaborn design sloop built in 1941 and owned by Bob Rogers. Still owned by Bob Rogers, I think. No, not anymore? No. Okay. It's owned by Woodruff Sebastian, so that boat. Okay. Oh, well. 
Oh, well, there you go. She got two pages in my book, and this one isn't in here because this is a landscape, as opposed to a portrait, which is a tall, skinny thing, which I had so many great-looking pictures of her. She got two pages of, lands of uh, portraits. This is the, the best looking of my landscapes. And this did not get in a book because it wouldn't fit on the pages. Um, this is her in 2005. This is another sad story. This is a boat I saw once. Um, this is a 60-foot pinky schooner rebuilt from a boat uh, for, from the ground up, in a boat which was splashed in 1830. Um, this is uh, Master Mariner's 2015. Now, a, a really a, a exceptional gentleman named uh, Luke McSweeney Mayhew owned this boat, and uh, he fell out of the tops of another one of his boats in Maine to his death at the ripe old age of 34, which is really sad. So I've never seen this boat before or since. I love this, this stern. Um, Apparently, this guy was quite a character, so well, another, another sad story. This is Valiant. I put her in to lighten things up a little bit. I don't know much about this boat. Uh, these pictures were taken in 2004 and 2014, but this is what caught my eye here. I think that is Express 37 Stewball's kite. <laughs> now, I, now, I don't know whether these guys are, are slip mates or, you know, whatever. Where do you get the kite for, you know, I've got pictures of Stewball with this kite up. So I'm just going, hmm, that's, that's an interesting shot. I guess uh, there's nothing about Valiant that would be called one, one design. So I suppose you could get away with, you know, throwing up with whatever rag you could find. Uh, and that's what happened here. This is um, Water Witch. Uh, she's a 56-foot beautiful cutter built by Lester Stone and Son in 1928. This shot is from 2017. She, this is a really beautiful boat. Uh, you all know Yankee. She was the um, she, she was the um, flagship of the St. Francis five different times under the Ford and McNeil families. Uh, she's on the hard now, Terry. No, she's in the water. She's back in the water. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I was afraid she was going to sink in the slip over here. Uh, you know, that's going back some years. But um, so that's it. She was built here, uh, right over here. I mean, yards from here. I think that was a stone boat yard back then, 1906. And here's another really famous boat you guys all know. This is a half of the two-page spread that Yucca has got, God bless Hank Eason. I hope, you, hope you're smiling at, at, at my talk, please. She's owned by Michael and Louise uh, Zoalizzi. I massacred their last name, but this was an eight meter that was splashed in uh, Newport Beach in 1937, and boy, does she cut a beautiful figure out on the water. Uh, really gorgeous. Okay, now, not, a book like this wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be worth getting if it didn't have crew shots in it. So this is years truly traipsing up and down the decks of uh, the St. Francis before the Master Mariners and the, um, the Jessica Cup regattas. And so uh, a lot of the people in this room are pictured in these, uh, in these uh, stern shots. Uh, I guess I'll tell you that you know who you are. Um, you're going to have to get them a lot closer to, to, to see yourselves, but uh, you're in there, let's put it that way. All right, now I put that one in here because this is alphabetical and I left somebody out. Can I get a round of applause for Ron Young, who has done to his own accounting something like 20 years worth of Tuesday and Wednesday Yachtsman's Luncheon, which is a real labor of love. And let me get that round of applause again. The guy, the guy deserves it. Anybody who's willing to put me up here seven or eight times can't be all good, but uh, you know, other than that, we'll we'll, cover, we'll cut him a little bit of slack. He will. He is actually ten percent older than I am. <laughs> I'm not ten percent younger than he is, but uh, he is ten percent older than I am, and you guys can work that one out. Um, but he's got twice my energy, to put it mildly. And when we started talking about this talk. 
he was telling me that Lat 38 has declared him officially the racingest boat, or I should say, youngster anyway, the racingest boat on San Francisco Bay. He says he has raced her 2,000 times, and uh, I, for one, am not in a position to argue with that. <laughs> Now, you've got to know, anybody know anything about an IOD other than, John, than Ron Young? Anybody here know anything about IODs? Okay, 25 of them were delivered to City Island, New York in December of 1936 for $2,670 shipping included from Norway. Now, I'm just guessing here that the boat probably costs twice that a year these days, <laughs> at least. My boat broker here could probably tell me that more, more accurately, but I thought you guys would get a kick out of that. Okay, well, I guess that's the end of the, the talk. We've a... Thank you all for coming, really appreciate that. When my, when my wife uh, called up and said there were four reservations for this thing, she, she, got, she got me worried a little bit, but uh, you guys all showed up and I really appreciate it, thank you. Great, Chris. Come and have a seat. Thank you. And, and now, grilling. oh, wait a minute. Sorry, Ron. I'm nowhere near finished with this thing yet. Okay, how do you interact with this thing? If you were so inclined, what I've done here is shown you the first page of my website. And right here in the middle, the prominence of place, is a thing called Master Mariner's Collection. And under that tab, if you went to it, you would find that I've taken a couple of thousand photographs, 750 of which made it into the book, but there were a couple thousand that would, would have made it could, had they fit, et cetera. Uh, and so what I've done is cut them up. This is, these are the A's and these are the B's, et cetera. So if you're so inclined, you can go to this website of mine and go find the boat you're interested in under one of those tabs. Um, these are some of the books I've created, the middle one being this one. We have a bunch of them over here, uh, if you're so inclined. Um, let's see, what else? These are the books. I don't need to take you through those. Were you to take a picture of this, we'll just leave this up. The one on the left, if you guys are monitored enough to know what QR codes are, if you got your phone out and took a picture of that, it would take you to my website where you can find the, the pictures of the Master Manor. It's the way I just showed you to. And this is the blurb bookstore for the Master Mariners uh, book that we were just talking about. Let's see, that's, that's all she wrote. Okay. Chris, it's also in the catch-off. Thank you. Great, Chris. Well done. Over Thank you. Okay, okay, over there. All right. I think I'm now done. Yes, Let yes. Go. Let me get around you and not fall off the stage. <clears throat> uh -huh. That should be really bad. So uh, we should, right off the bat, we should think the person who's really responsible for this talk, and that's the person who release, releases Chris to go <laughs> fiddling around with cameras all the time. Kim, thank you so much for giving us Chris Ray. Good grief. The untold hours Chris spends. What would I do without her? On the water no doing telling. this. So Chris, how many days a year are you typically on the water shooting photos? Give me a tick what number. That's a great question. Uh, literally, from uh, it, it starts this weekend, Saturday, with the intercollegiate regatta, and pretty much every Saturday until uh, the Jessica Cup or the, actually the big sale on a Tuesday, um, I'll be out uh, one day trying to get uh, pictures of uh, whatever's going on. So now is that like 30 that's, weekends? That's, that's if she hasn't carted me off someplace else. That's right. When Chris is not here, he enjoys a great life of vacations. I, I, um, yeah. uh, I know that's that. So, good. Um, so first off, let's see the number of people who currently own a wooden boat. This is a measure of intelligence or lack of. Great question. Now, the really smart people, the hands of those people who used to but don't currently own a wooden boat. <laughs> now, these are the really smart ones in the crowd. <laughs> the happiest two days, right? Exactly, the happiest two days. Um, so... Um, Quickly, I'll address the, uh, my wonderful boat youngster of 33 years. Uh, Latitude declared her the most raced boat in 2021, a pandemic year, for, because we raced 64 races that year. We usually race over 80. Um, and so right after they declared that, and it was in Latitude 38, uh, the head of the technical uh, committee of the IODs in the East Coast called me. 
Um, and he said, Ron, I just want you to know, rem remind you, you keep telling me you want youngster to live to be 100. I said, yes. And he said, but Ron, every time you sail around San Francisco Bay and you pull in the backstay and um, there's, you know, four knots of ebb current and quite a bit of chop, you're shortening the boat. Your boat bow lifts up about five, eight inches. And when you let the backstay off again, uh, you know, she is never going to last to be 100 if you keep doing what you're doing. And I said, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I love racing her. And he said, yes, Ron, but even, listen to me, he said, listen, even Secretariat was finally allowed to go to pasture. <laughs> and I thought about it and he said, you know, what you want to do is you want her to live a long time, but she can't be a racing thoroughbred all that time. She can't do that for a hundred years. You've got to let her have some time in a beautiful pasture. So I thought about it. And I thought the place around here that is that pasture is Spalding Boatworks. We should all say hooray for Spalding. And I knew Myron, of course, as a little boy. He was a big influence on, on my childhood, really, and uh, Sea Scout world. Anyway, so I gifted her to Spalding on the condition that they not do with her what I've been doing with her for the 33 years I owned her. <laughs> that they, in fact, don't race her 80 races a year, that they race her very seldom and they take young people sailing on her and they keep her in beautiful, beautiful shape. So that's where Youngster went. She went to pasture. But I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand not having a wooden boat. I couldn't take the idea of looking Terry Klaus and Lindsay Klaus in the eye when they asked about the Master <laughs> Mariner not having a boat. So I um, bought Olay, the L36 Olay. And uh, as those who sold it to me reminded me, it had been twice uh, best in show in the wooden boat show over in Corinthian. So that made me all the more thrilled. And one of the pictures they showed me had Olay in the wooden boat show and Youngster next to her. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's a good transition. So I bought her. And Terry, I will be there to race her all through the uh, Master Mariner season. I'm thrilled as peaches to have her. And to keep the racing thing going a, a little bit more, I chartered um, uh, Canar 99 to race her on the you know, south end of the bay. What are you going to call 99? Well, Surely not Gnarly Boo. No, no, correct. You're right. No, she's currently called Gusto, but she did have that name when a great when Jason Holloway owned her. But no, she'll never have that name on my <laughs> hands. Um, let's see. Um, so the thing, Chris, that's amazing about your shots is you also shot the America's Cup foiling creatures outside. You also shot the Five O Worlds. If you go to the upstairs. Go, go everywhere in the club. You see five old world shots. You have, you know, so first of all, how many cameras do you own? Uh, there are two main ones. What do you shoot? What do you use? You're reminding me that I meant to bring my drone and I forgot to, but that's, you know, that's the... Uh, cameras first. How many cameras? Well, the drone's got a camera. That's what it I'm is. I'm going to ask about drones. Yeah, okay. So first so you have two cameras. There are two Canon cameras that I carry with me in a, in a bag, one with a big long lens and one with a small lens. When you shoot these shots, get, tell us about the data file size. Oh, that's a... That's a terrific question. Um, without being able to see it, you don't won't know what I'm talking about. But I'm standing on the race deck and I'm taking pictures of the bridge to bridge uh, race, which is uh, these all these crazy things. And I got a picture with my first Olympus digital camera. I gave it to uh, Annika Lurson, who was our uh, you know the race office person at the time. She puts it on a website and some guy scrapes it off the website in Australia and contacts me, he wants to make it the cover of a, of a magazine because it has an Australian 18, a windsurfer and a kite surfer all in the same picture with, with Alcatraz behind. So it's where it is and what it is. It's the first time the three craft have been caught racing together. This is you know, a blind pig finds an acorn once in a while. I have no <laughs> idea that that's what I got in the shot or no idea why anybody would be interested in that. So that's the good news. Bad news is that this photograph is, you know, like 800 megs. It's nowhere, pardon me, 800K. It's nowhere big enough to make the resolution you need to put on the cover of a magazine. And we struggle with that for a long, long time. That was 2001. Um, the cameras now are so smart and so dense that, you know, you can click on the kitchen sink option and it will clean the dishes for you. Um, they're extremely dense. You can shoot in raw and in uh, the, the regular densest mode and it'll still take 999 photographs. 
I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable the, the distance the technology has come in the last 20 years. So how many meg is a typical shot that you shoot? Uh, very often there'll be 15? 10 megabytes, something like that. 10, okay. Great. And so how many, um, how many shots do you shoot a year, do you think? A year, I have no idea. A, a typical race out here, I'll come home with somewhere between three and 500 photographs, depending upon what was going on and how many classes were racing. Um, I just wanted to notice, while we're still on the phones, it, you know, it's still on the, the cameras, everybody in this room has more uh, photographic power in their pocket or on the, on the table than I started out with, by far. These, these Apple phone cameras are, and Samsung phone cameras are, uh, well, that's Philippe Kahn, isn't it? Um, another member here who, who managed to put the two technologies together, a phone and a camera, and man. I mean, it, so how many drones do you have? I have, well, I've had four. I have crashed two, or <laughs> one and a half of them. Uh, one of them is right at the base of the bee buoy, if anybody's interested. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm shooting the start of a NARA race, so you're going to be doing this before much longer. And, uh, you know, I've got, I've got it set up where we can watch the starting line from a great overhead shot. And I'm standing next to Kermit Schickel, and he goes, uh, did you just splash your drone? And I'm looking at the camera. Now, you're sp no. for those of you who are pilots or have your own drones, et cetera, et cetera, the rule is you're supposed to be in within eyesight of your drone. Now, the fact that you can't see them after they're 100 yards away and the range is miles, uh, one wonders how you could keep it in sight, but never mind all that. I'm looking at a screen, and I, all of a sudden I'm getting this <clears throat> aircraft disconnected message. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kermit, I think maybe I just splashed my drone. <laughs> So what's your favorite photo boat? When you're shooting from a boat, what do you like to shoot from? Oh, uh, uh, there were lots of answers to that until the 5 O's, And now the answer to that is Lucky Duck, which is owned by, by uh, Dave McEwen. Right. And uh, Lucky Duck is a great platform, and the, and the drinks are always there, and uh, the missus is making sandwiches, and uh, it's a very comfortable platform from which to shoot boats. Now, Which is an axle bar. Describe what you're talking about. Are you talking about the axle bar one, or are you talking about... The, the big... Because I sailed on his 52-footer at Santa Cruz City, too, as Lucky Duck. But you mean the axle no bar, the speedboat? No sailing going on here. And not the speedboat. Much, not much speedboat, either. This is... Uh, Which one? Oh, the powerboat. Yeah. Okay. That duck. Just this plain duck. The, the yeah. duck. And Ocean this Alexander. Is, this is the same size as, uh, as Forever Young, I think. Somewhere no, he's, in, that's, he has a bigger boat. Well, it happens. <laughs> it, it happens. Dave's but, is bigger. But, uh, <laughs> Does and size matter, it, it, though? It's yeah, uh, No. Good. <laughs> it's an Ocean Alexander. It's a beautiful boat. Okay, yeah, so no. that's what and you it's like. A great, it's a great platform to shoot from. Okay. Uh, it's an OA-72, for those who <laughs> want to know about it. It's a beautiful boat. We had, uh, I, I decided to try for the second time to shoot a regatta f with a drone from a boat. Now... Real men, as you probably know, I, was, I made a wonderful living in tech uh, for years, but real men don't read manuals. Uh, so, you know, I, there are a number of things about a drone which are you know, automatic, and you have to turn them off, but you have to read the manual to figure out how to find that switch. And uh, the, the drones I've had have all these uh, motion sensor and um, obstruction sensors that will keep them from coming on to a big, hard thing like a boat or a thing that has antennas or anything like that. So you have to turn all the collision detection gear off. Well, I don't realize that. <laughs> so I'm that trying was to, in the manual. I, I'm trying, well, of course. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to take a picture of, a, of the start of the, of the TP-52s off of Treasure Island for a big boat series a number of years ago. And I'm in the boat with a couple of North Sails hot shots. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a protector, and I'm trying to get my drone back. And the... The warning's going, the beeping's going, the battery life's coming to an end. You know, now, remember, the, all the pictures are on a card that's in the, in the drone. So when the drone sinks, uh, that's, there go the pictures. So I got to get the drone back. And every time I'd get it close, it would jump away from, it would sense an antenna or the hard top of a protector, what have you. Uh, and so I finally tell the guy, Piers, you're going to have to back down on this, on this thing really fast. 
If you just leave it in hover, take your hands off the wheel and turn the thing off, it's going to drop like a stone. You need to be under it when it drops. And we managed it somehow. So we got away with it that time. So on the Ocean Alexander, I try this for a second time, having read the manual this time. And so I get the the start shot. Now the beauty of the five O's, if anybody, no wooden boat owner would ever do this in their right mind. But in the five O's, they use a thing called a rabbit start where there is a boat that's in the race that actually crosses in front of everyone and they're supposed to go right off her transom. And there's even a boat to protect her from getting rammed, which would happen a lot, especially when you got a bunch of guys who want to be world champions. And so I'm droning this from Dave McEwen's Ocean Alexander, and I'm in the right place, and my drone is right over the rabbit boat and its pro and the little protector. We used one of those little VR jobs. With, uh, the two guys who did this, our race committee guys, were wearing helmets, and they needed them. <laughs> These guys are aggressive. Anyway, there was a protest in this boat because the protecting boat was not close enough, and our own world champion whose name you're going to supply me with because it just Mike Martin. my head, Mike Martin. Mike Martin, and with Adam, Adam Lowry on the bow. And Adam Lowry. They're, they're trying to get between the rabbit and its protector because they have allowed some space to occur. And so at this point, uh, Lawson, you know, jams on the accelerator and gets up there, and now Mike has to make a decision. And, of course, he ducks, which he has to because uh, he has no choice at this point. But it makes a mess out of his start. And my drone is right over this. So I ask Lawson, I've got a film Lawson Willard, ERG. who's driving the boat, yeah. who's driving the protector. He's currently chairman of the board, and at this time he would have been executive race director. I said, I've got, a, I've got footage of this, and he says, please publish it on Monday. <laughs> that's after the last protest is over. <laughs> and that's up on... Uh, on uh, my website on the, on the YouTube channel, which is very entertaining to watch a rabbit start at all and to watch this happen also. So right about now, I'm, you know, I've, I've shot this rabbit start. I'm really pleased with myself. The visibility is really awful, extremely bright out. And even though the monitor for my drone is designed for looking at in bright sunshine, I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out where the, where the thing is. And so I managed to get the Ocean Alexander in the picture, and so now that it's getting bigger, I know that the drone's coming back, so that's good. <laughs> it had about 5% of its batteries left by the time it got to me. Now, the boat's, you know, pitching around. We're in that washing machine, sometimes known as uh, Little Alcatraz area, and uh, uh, finally get it over me and drop it in my lap before it ran out of batteries. So it's uh, always, uh, oh, the, one other thing is fun about a drone and a boat. You have to read the manual to know this, too. The drone will set its takeoff point and return there if it loses touch with its control. Oh, that's great if you're on <laughs> land. But if you're on a boat and you've moved, it's going to go back to where it started until you tell it, unless you change the control in there and say, return to your controller's last position. So that's... Uh, Those drones are so smart. <laughs> they, they are really fun. You know, oh, uh, there's one other kind of scary thing. Now, the, the drones I have are Phantoms 4s. Uh, that's a DJI product. That's a, you know, a Chinese company, uh, which clearly reports to the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, so, I, unbeknownst to me, I'm, I'm cruising through the menus of my... When I'm, re when I'm connecting my controller to a brand new drone and I stumble on this bit of history I didn't realize existed, which is every flight of my prior drones, every place they went, how long they were in the air, what they saw, everything. Whoa, I had no idea. You know. Now, Kim's boss from many years ago, a fellow named Scott McNeely at Sun Microsystems, says you have no privacy, get over it. But, you know, just finding out, you turn a corner and you find out, oh, they've been tracking all this stuff, and, well, how about you there? <laughs> <laughs> so how does the book get made? Where was it printed? Oh, great question. And um, give us the steps between, okay, I want to make a book now. What, are the, what do you, you, you got to go through the art direction phase, select the photographs, and you supply, and yeah, you do an incredible amount of, you, do, you decide how you want to lay it out, you decide what you want page layouts to look like. 
And then you, did you go to a publisher? Did you self-publish? How did you do it? Great, great question. Um, in the old days, 2000 and before, uh, you would have, I would have had to actually connect with other people. My, all my mythanthropic tendencies would have to have been dropped. I would have had to make friends with other people who had expertise in these areas <laughs> and uh, you know, connect with people. That's not my thing. Like, uh, my wife does that very well, but me, no, people are, uh, uh. so at any rate, I figure out if I can figure out how to do it myself, away I go. And over the course of, from, since 2000, the, the A, the, the, the density of the photograph and all these other processes have come together to make this possible. So a, a one-man band like me can actually put together a thing, design the whole thing, no art director necessary. Um, AI may make that even better, but who knows. Um, and so these are one-off the name of this particular publisher, there are more than one, but this is Blurb Publishing. And literally, you can make a, a book like this one at a time. And uh, now, the bad news is, when you publish like this one at a time, they're expensive because it's a one-off thing. Now, revving it when you've made a mistake um, is fairly simple. The next edition is, is excellent. I'm glad you led me there because I wanted to talk about this. What I did was take a bunch of really pretty pictures of a really cool subject, old racing sailboats. And I put in the book the date the photo was taken. But other than the name of the boat, basically nothing else about the boat. Turns out every one of these boats has a really deep history. And I would be very interested in a collaborative <clears throat> effort to actually recreate a a version of the book that had the the books the the boat's story with it. You know that would be a great deal more complicated than what this is. This is easy for me to do, and when I mis make a mistake, I can fix it really easily. So how to go about a collaborative effort like that? I mean, uh, Wikipedia. You're, I presume most everyone here is uh, familiar with Wikipedia. You can go in and edit the Ron Young story on Wikipedia, and if Ron Young doesn't get a wind of it, you know, you can have his Communist Party membership and all the other stuff he was involved in. <laughs> but hopefully he does get wind of it, he goes in and makes sure that the story is more or less the correct story for... Uh, or the Politburo, the, the Politburo. Well, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so the upshot of all that is it, be, it might be a really cool book to have the story of each of these boats to the extent we know it or the extent the owner wants to share it um, in another edition. Now, a, a middle step to that possibly would be my website has these boats broken out by alphabet and in the comments section, you can put what you know about your boat or what you know about your friend's boat into the comments section and I could use that to pull together and that's a nice interim step that isn't expensive. So if I hear you right, that's an invitation by those who see this talk in here. And by the way, we are being live streamed, if you didn't see it on your phone, uh, from the moment the first bell was rang. This has all been live streamed on YouTube. And um, so that's where, and the archive of this talk goes into the other 290 or so talks that we've done since we began recording them in 2000, the end of 2017. So we're in the club's of library, but they're also in YouTube, so anybody can access these talks. And I think what you just said is, by the way, if you go to the comments section on your website and you want to submit, um, let's just say uh, up to 150 words, or you pick the number about a particular any particular boat, this would be a way that you'd be up to collecting data points. I should say, I think that's a fun uh, invitation, Chris, a really good one. When I wrote the email that you many of you may have received in inviting you to this talk, I basically looked at Chris's pictures and I wrote what I knew about the boat in those captions. In any of you who received the email, that's where those captions came from. They came out of, sort of out of my head. Because I think what you've done with that book is you've actually captured a whole incredible amount of history that sort of doesn't really exist accessibly around the club too much. Because it's a picture you were able to get together. I think there's how many pictures are in there? 
Well, the book has 750, but there, I've got 20,000 of these for this class. But you have 750 pictures in there, and there are members that many of us have of boats that we sailed on that are in there. And so Aldi Alessi, I sailed on Mistress as Fairland Clipper when I was a kid, and, and he used to sail these Buckner races. How many people raced a Buckner race? You really, that proves how unsmart we are, because a Buckner <laughs> race is like something like 120 or so miles. We, as I recall, we'd go out the gate, we'd go around the Fairlands, we'd go up to Drake's Bay, outside the Fairlands, down to Half Moon Bay, come back and come in. And everybody at the end of the Buckner race, we'd be coming, running in, in the, across a potato patch, all of us would look at the crew with each other, we'd say, never, I will never, I will never do this again. <laughs> Overnight, it was ridiculous, out here in the potato patch, out here in the Northwestern blowing day and night. And we all swore we would never do this. And then about... Ten months later, our skipper would call and say, oh, by the way, you know, whatever it was, uh, July 16th, we'd say, oh, that's not on my calendar. And he'd say, wait, oh, wait, okay, July 16th. And we'd say yes, and pretty soon all of a sudden we realized, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> I said yes to another Buckner race. Anyway, so those memories, you know, I can't find those anywhere but in your book. <laughs> They're frightening. So. I, you know, the fact that the human race has been around for as long as it has is dependent on women forgetting the pain of childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> also, you have Ace. Who sailed at Ace? Ace was a famous boat when I was a little kid. Artie Russo, Terry Klaus knows much of this history, Nikki's grand uncle, Nick Raggio, who was sitting there a little while ago, Nick Raggio's uncle was Artie Ru grand uncle was Artie Russo. He developed part of the Sunset District. Back in those days, tech wasn't what we think of as Silicon Valley, but the modern technology where guys were building houses like crazy. Dolger, Denny Jordan, Artie Russo, those guys built big sections. Denny Jordan did parts of Castro Valley and over there. Were, well, so those guys had boats, and they all were turning each other onto yachting. Our, our ace was this our boat, this gorgeous 43-foot thing that we got to touch and race on as little kids. And you bring that all back to life with your book. So, you know, Chris, thank you, man. It's really cool. Thank you. It was a labor of love. I, it's my homage to the folks who have spent the time to keep these boats up, which is not inconsistent. So it's our pleasure to have you as a speaker of the Wednesday Yachting Lunch, and thanks for sharing your insights with us. Chris Ray, thank thanks you. Thanks for doing it, Ron. Thank you. And with that, we adjourn. Now, I have some of these over here. Should any be? I have some of these over here. Should any be so? Anybody be so inclined? Or there are more to the, uh, the catch-all. has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.